For the better part of a year, the struggle against Cobb City has faced escalating levels of state repression. On January 18th, Tortuguita was executed in the Walani Forest by a state-sanctioned death squad. Is this target practice? Over the next two months, dozens of people were charged with domestic terrorism for trespassing in the woods or on the basis of alleged proximity to acts of rioting and property destruction. In late May, the state targeted the movement's legal defense infrastructure, arresting three members of the Atlanta Solidarity Fund on trumped-up money laundering charges. More recently, on August 28th, 61 individuals were indicted under Georgia's Enhanced Racketeer-Influenced and Corrupt Organizations, or RICO Act. Voices within the mainstream U.S. political and media establishment have denounced this latest prosecution as disproportionate and excessive. This indictment is ridiculously broad. The actual individual criminal acts didn't scan to me. One prosecutor resigned because they thought that the way this case was being handled was inappropriate. This is just a way to silence protesters, deter them from using their First Amendment constitutional protection. From a legal perspective, the state's case appears extremely weak and shockingly sloppy. Dozens of individuals are facing the threat of decades behind bars, in some cases for simply handing out flyers or sharing a social media post. Despite the serious nature of the charges, it's hard to imagine some of them going to trial. Federal RICO statutes were first introduced in the 1970s to help prosecutors go after the mafia and other centralized criminal enterprises engaged in large-scale racketeering schemes. In using Georgia's RICO law against a decentralized political movement, Critics charged the state's Republican Attorney General, Chris Carr, with seeking to criminalize protest itself. In a sense, they're right. But by framing this current wave of repression as an abuse of the U.S. justice system, a violation of its democratic norms and constitutionally protected rights, or an extension of national partisan politics, these critics miss a fundamental truth about the nature of state power. At its core, the state is an instrument of social war. Its actions aren't guided by lofty principles of justice, but by the logic of counterinsurgency. This is the lens through which the state views all conflict. RICO charges have been wielded against a spectrum of political threats in the so-called United States. Ranging from Matulu Shakur, Sakao Dinga, Sylvia Beraldini, and Marilyn Buck's successful efforts to liberate Masada Shakur, to Donald Trump and Rudy Giuliani's botched attempt to overturn the 2020 election. Georgia even used it against teachers in Atlanta, whose alleged criminal racket was an effort to funnel more money to terminally underfunded majority Black school districts. Counterinsurgency doctrine uses repression as a tactic to divide and isolate a dissident or insurgent element from its broader base of support. The larger group is then corralled back into legal channels of resistance that do not threaten state power. Police apply this principle to social movements by associating repression with specific criminalized tactics, such as property destruction, carried out by the more militant sections of the movement. In the struggle against Cop City, this has proven difficult. Since its inception, movement participants have embraced a diversity of tactics, ranging from sabotage, property destruction, and other forms of direct action, to strategies of civic, political engagement, and nonviolent protest. Crucially, activists who have chosen more moderate tactics have rejected the state's calls to condemn and isolate those who have chosen a more militant path of direct action. This is a movement driven by shared opposition to the expansion and modernization of policing. It is, therefore, in its aims and essence, against the law. Unable to carve out and isolate a militant fringe or a more moderate element to recuperate, The state has sought to criminalize the Stop Cop City movement in its entirety. 
to cauterize the struggle by raising the stakes of solidarity and discouraging any future actions from being carried out under its banner. It is a testament to the strength of the Stop Cop City movement and its success in delegitimizing the state and corporate backers of the Atlanta Police Foundation that these charges appear so desperate and so brazenly political. It's also a testament to the bravery of the movement that its supporters remain so undeterred. The day after the RICO charges were handed down, five members of the faith-based coalition to stop Cop City were arrested after chaining themselves to bulldozers at the construction site. Thousands more are expected to march to the site on November 13th as a part of a coordinated campaign dubbed Block Cop City. Recognizing the movement's decentralized nature as a strength, police, prosecutors, and local politicians have also attempted to divide it along racial and geographic lines by playing the outside agitator card wielded so effectively during the George Floyd rebellion. Groups of outside radicals and agitators. Here too, they have faced challenges. Like the Western Hemisphere Institute for Security Cooperation, located 100 miles away in Columbus, Georgia, and better known as the School of the Americas. The so-called Atlanta Public Safety Training Center is intended as a regional training facility. If built, it will be used to teach police forces from multiple U.S. cities and states how to more effectively kill people and put down revolts. Through multinational initiatives like the International Association of the Chiefs of Police and the Georgia International Law Enforcement Exchange, these tactics will be shared with police forces in countries allied to or otherwise subjugated by U.S. imperialism. Millions of people have a vested interest in the outcome of this struggle, as it will directly determine the shape of police repression that our movements will face in the years to come. And so it is not enough to simply be against a project like Cop City, to sign your name to a petition, or to share a post about it on the internet. The United States doesn't care what you think about how it trains its domestic security forces or the security forces of allied nations. It only cares to the extent that those thoughts are turned into actions. The stakes are high. Repression is scary. The way forward is unclear. But given the state's efforts to isolate and pacify resistance to Cop City, it follows that any effective response must involve materially supporting the targets of state repression while finding innovative ways to spread and deepen conflict. Solidarity means attack. Cop City will never be built.